Thank you so much and welcome back um, to another exciting uh, session. I think the, the next session builds up very well um, on, the, on the previous session. Um, I think Joel spoke very well about the, the opportunities and the readiness uh, of um, Africa in terms of uh, AI adoption. Um, and um, I think uh, Peter will, will take it further and, and speak on a, on a global level how AI is, is being used um, in, in drug uh, discovery. So with, without wasting much time, our, our next speaker is uh, Peter Hanstock. And uh, Peter is the machine learning and AI technical lead advisor. And um, he advised and guided the technical direction of Pfizer's machine learning, deep learning, and AI entries into natural language processing, image processing, and predictive modeling. And he's also a Harvard University lecturer uh, teaching the master's software engineering capstan and the graduate level, um, teaching machine learning and uh, data mining courses. Um, he's also developed um, uh, 30 novel visualization analytics tools in use at Pfizer. And um, he holds a PhD in computer science, emphasizing on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, Peter, we, we, we look forward to, to, to this um, uh, presentation. Uh, considering uh, COVID-19 and the vaccine, I think it would be very interesting to hear how uh, artificial intelligence uh, plays a role in developing uh, the drugs. Uh, welcome, Peter. Yes, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you including me. Uh, so I'm coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts, and we just had two days of rain, uh, but it's now cool fall weather. We are half a world apart, I think, but we have uh, very similar ideas in terms of artificial intelligence and in the challenges that we face in getting it into uh, use for healthcare and pharmaceutical space. So why do we do artificial intelligence? Well, we have this idea of the, the construction of knowledge. We're trying to leverage it to make better decisions. And our knowledge comes to us from different places. It comes from evolution. It's built into our genes. Birds don't have to learn how to build a nest. They, they know how to do it uh, from birth. Um, it also comes to us over a shorter time frame in terms of culture, where we pass wisdom on between generations. Of course, we have our own knowledge and experience as we go through our careers and education. But as the, as the knowledge is coming faster, and the information and data are coming faster and faster to us, we can't keep up. We now rely on artificial intelligence and computation to extract the knowledge and put it together for us. And this is quite a, a novel change. Um, and it's a, it pushes us in a different place than we have been before. Unlike some of the other companies, the large companies like the Googles and the Amazons, we don't have a single AI problem. Instead, we have thousands of small problems in the pharma space. And there's AI opportunities across the entire pipeline from the drug research into the drug development of clinical trials. There's target selection. There's the screening and testing, how to take a, a base molecule and make it as good as possible in 42 days or 10 years, whoever it takes. There's lots of extra testing in the and then there's the clinical trials and approvals and, and the business side even beyond that. And that breaks down to lots of classes of problems like literature mining, data analysis, biomarkers, safety, and improving the design. And then there's all sorts of things for patient recruitment and wearable sensors and other new technologies. And we'll talk about a few of these just very quickly. I'm gonna give you some examples of some small problems that we've been looking at and trying to solve. So where are we in terms of this AI journey? Well, it started a long time ago. I realize I'm preaching to the choir, but back in 1958, we had the start of AI and it kicked off and it went into this thing called the AI winter, where people realized it wasn't gonna solve all the problems. And then we had a new wave in the 1980s with expert systems and rule-based systems, and then those things failed. And so now we're into this new era. Well, even before we ended this era, we had great successes such as um, AI breakthroughs in 1997, where IBM's Deep Blue beat one of the grand chess masters. But since then, AI's come a long way. We now have this thing called AlexNet and the start of deep learning. And it was first applied to image understanding. And it did it so well that all the previous work in image understanding and recognizing people and objects was thrown away and replaced by this new deep learning technology. 
And so we've been able to use this within pharma in a number of different places. Um, the, 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 the technology was so good that the error rates that they had measured for different competitions on ImageNet, trying to recognize 200 different classes of objects, the error rates went down and down and down. And eventually in 2016 or so, um, they surpassed human performance. And so it enabled computers to be able to recognize objects about as well as people. It was so good that they actually ended the competition because there was no point in continuing. We've seen similar breakthroughs in speech and other areas. But what are we using that for in Pfizer? Um, well, we have a lot of images. Uh, we take lots of images, and this is a histology one, which is a slice of tissue. These images are massive, 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So many times larger than your, your iPhone pictures. Um, we need experts to look at these images. It takes them several minutes to look at different resolutions. And they look at the, the fat cells, the nuclei, and different stained aspects and try to determine, is this normal or is there something wrong with it? We've been able to replace some of the pathologists or at least make them more efficient by focusing their work on the ones where the machines can't do a very good job. And so even with a small training set of about a thousand of these images, we're able to accurately identify the normal versus abnormal. And so we've saved and freed up the pathologist to do new work. Another bottleneck in the pipeline has been crystal classification. If we can get the crystal clap, if we can get a crystal from a protein, well, then we can understand how a particular drug might bind into that particular binding pocket. But the bottleneck of the process is actually going through the different experimental data and saying, well, is there a crystal in this image? Is it clear? Is there some kind of precipitate? Or maybe it's a hair or, or other weird thing that we, we just don't know. And this is the bottleneck, which means we can only test a few hundred images at a time. But we found a way of getting 90% accuracy in being able to classify and identify the crystals uh, from the other ones. And this is going to really speed things up uh, for this entire group and for the drug research. The images led the way in the deep learning, but we've now have a new wave of natural language processing. And so there's now new techniques for deep learning with NLP. It started with the word to VEC from Google. And now in 2018, just a couple of years ago, we have these BERT models, which are really pushing forward our natural language processing capabilities. So what are we doing with these? Um, we had this one project called the Genie that was written by a, a group of students of mine at Harvard. The goal was trend detection. Can we leverage the literature, 30 million abstracts uh, from PubMed, and figure out which disease gene combinations will make it into a drug trial phase two, five years in the future? And so that's quite an a ambitious goal because we can't do that as humans very well. But can we do it using an automated approach using tons of data? And so we set up an experiment to look past to do retrospective analyses. We use clinicaltrials.gov, which says all the results of all the different clinical trials, put it together, and they came up with a, a nice visualization tool that looks at the trends of uh, this one's P53, um, and this one is the breast neoplasms disease. So it's basically a breast cancer. How many how many publications are there per year for that? And how many publications are there with the P53 gene? And together, how many have both of these things together? And so we see a, a dramatic rise from 2007 or so up through 2015 where it peaked and it seemed to have kind of dropped off since then. And so this allows a user or a scientist to go through and figure out and look at the different trends and see what's there. But what we really wanted to do was a prediction model. And so they worked on a prediction model to do that and actually came up with a, a pretty good result um, using, they had an area of 71% under the rock curve, which means that they can get about 75 to 80% of the ones accurately identified and about 20% of the wrong ones were included in that threshold, which is pretty good since there's actually no scientific knowledge or expertise being built into this. It's just leveraging the literature. And they found that the rankings of the journal that would was publishing the article, and the number of citations it had were very interesting features in this particular methodology. Another approach we tried is to mine data from patents. And so patents have a, a wealth of scientific information, but this particular problem was trying to find epitopes. Um, if we think about an antibody trying to bind a particular protein in such a location that it prevents it from working as it normally would. So perhaps it's a defective protein. How do we block it and stop it from doing its normal thing? 
the place that it binds is called the epitope. And so we're looking for patent claims that say these particular locations on that long protein are interesting. And to do that, they have to go through all these patents, which are 50 pages long. They have to pull out all the different kinds of information, read all these things, understand all the legal context, and then put it together for the, both the scientists and the lawyers. And that process takes weeks or months to do it for just one target. And so our solution called OpenPSV, Patent Scope Visualization, was designed to replace that process automatically. And so what it does is it goes through a series of patents that the lawyers have identified with their search. Um, it looks for the different positions of the locations of the gene. It also has a list of all the different amino acids that are within the patent. So this is the base sequence of the genes. It then has to go through all these difficult legal claims that make no sense to me since I'm not a lawyer. A kit for detecting H5 subtype avian influenza virus. It doesn't sound like English to me, but um, it says that there's a claim on these particular part of this given sequence. And if we can pull out all those different parts, well, then we can put them together and identify them in a nice visualization. And so what the has been able to show is that we can take the full gene and say, well, this particular patent covers these regions. This other patent from another company contains these regions. We can see exactly what the landscape is of what's working, what's not, which parts are claimed, and we can understand the science behind it. What do we do with all these things that we extract in natural language processing? We're currently headed on a strategy of knowledge graphs, which look like this. It's a graphical representation of data that both humans and computers can understand. And so it might say a particular gene SNP modifies a particular gene because it's a, a change of a base. And that gene might upregulate another gene, which up downregulates another gene, which is associated with a particular disease. And that particular drug blocks this gene, which might be associated with that. And how do we construct all these different relationships? Well, we're using natural language processing to understand these. And then we're using machine learning to see if we can make predictions on, can this particular drug, uh, which was used for a lung disease, can it be applied to COVID? And so can we make a prediction of this drug to this disease over here? And so we have lots of opportunities to leverage science with a combination of human insights as well as machine uh, learning techniques to draw links and inferences from the data. We're now into a really exciting phase um, where we've kind of gone past the imaging, past the natural language processing, but really focused on AI for in deep learning for bioinformatics for the pharma space and, and drug discovery. And so it's a really new era that's only just a few years old. We're nowhere close to an AI winter where things are going red hot right now, and it's a very exciting time for AI in this space. There's so much data, um, but we have a, a, a challenge that's very similar to what our previous speaker mentioned, everything based on data. Uh, we need to have our data in place, make sure it's correct, make sure everything's aligned before we can start our process. Everyone's very worried about falling behind our competitors. And so we're making lots of PowerPoint slides saying this is an idea that we have on how we can leverage AI for these kinds of problems. And once we've gone past that stage, we collaborate with different people to see if we can bring the best of AI um, and partner with different companies with their expertise. At the same time, we're also building internal data science teams and trying to at least to get the capability of running things out of the box. Because there's great technology sitting out there in the public domain, and we're bringing it in and applying it to different problems. We're still a ways from being machine learning capable um, in, in most parts of our company, and we're a long way from being an AI-driven company like a Google, like an Uber, or anything like that, where they have modern data sets, modern infrastructure, and really we're designed on it. Whereas we're designed with this 100-year-old process in the pharma space and 100 years of different data systems. And so we're, we're working towards it. So why is it a problem? Um, our challenge of data integration is huge. We have both internal data, thousands of databases. Uh, every new instrument comes with its own database that we need to connect and understand, plus all the external data that's public and available and, and how these link together. We also have challenges of talent that what the previous speaker also mentioned. We have lots of scientists, we have IT folks, we have statistics, but AI people who have this combination of expertise in the science and pharma and biology chemistry, as well as the programming skill and statistics skill, they're very hard to find. Uh, we're hoping to find more of them, but we're also trying to develop talent and, and find more people in the space. 
what are the opportunities for AI? Well, we have a lot of people in our industry are used to using the scientific method where we generate a hypothesis, we test it, and then we iterate that process. But now we're at a point in, the, in time where we have more research than we can consume. We, we need AI to figure out the interesting research. We have these large patterns of, of thousands of data points. For a single drug, we have 89 different endpoints that we have to meet. Humans can only conceive of about two of these at a time. So how can we come up with the best? And what's the process for doing it? We can't really form hypotheses across highly multi-dimensional data spaces. And even if we could, we can't analyze all the data. And so AI is starting to play a role in here and kind of adjust the scientific method to allow for these automated techniques to generate hypotheses and test things. Um, a recent paper came out kind of emphasizing this idea. It was in the Nature Methods. It was talking about deep learning for image analysis and cells. And it said AI is able to it's positioned to render difficult analyses routine, enable researchers to carry out new previously impossible experiments. We had the technology to run the experiments. What we didn't have is the analysis capability to be able to unravel the results and interpret them. And AI is now providing it, which means we can go through with better and more complete experiments. It's an exciting time for it. In addition, we have a, a new sets of technology. We have wearable sensors coming in. I'm wearing a Fitbit right now, but we have more exciting versions of that technology that are looking at Parkinson's disease and, and your heart disease and other things. We have health records um, and medical records coming in. We have tissue data and samples um, from images. We also have these public and, and internal data sets of proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, genomics, lots of omics. And we're trying to figure out what the right framework is. It is a data framework, but is that all we can be? Can we do more? What we're heading towards is a, a unifying framework that's going to look a lot like a deep learning approach. We're going to integrate the data and make different models on it using deep learning. Uh, that'll take the different sets of data independently, merge it together, and allow us to do new advanced things such as personalized medicine or this new area of digital twins where we can take all the different information, take one individual with their particular characteristics and try to predict what a particular medicine will do to that individual. It's the, we have similar ideas in advertising. If they see an ad versus they not see an ad, but now we do the same thing in healthcare uh, where we apply a certain method, a certain drug or certain remedy and see, try to predict what's gonna happen to that person. It also deals with synthetic control arms for clinical trials, which is one of the more expensive aspects, uh, clinical trials of drug discovery. We also see a lot of exciting things happening in the chemistry and biologically drug optimization. The previous speaker talked about the, uh, the quick turnaround in 41 days, I believe it was, from in silico medicine. Um, it's a fantastic breakthrough. It was actually using these generative adversarial networks. Um, and so it's the ability to optimize small molecules or, or typical tablets using deep learning and doing it automatically. And so be able to hop between different scaffolds and try to optimize a drug against multiple characteristics by synthesizing them virtually, coming up with different models, testing them automatically and so on, and then iterating through that process to optimize them. And we also see a similar push towards that in the peptides and the biological space. It's an exciting times. It's generally not going to be as exciting as 41 days because that particular one added just one molecule, sorry, one atom to a previously existing molecule, which is why it only took 41 days. But for a new scaffold and a new drug, it'll take much longer still. But the combination of human expertise with these kinds of optimizations is really promising. Another huge advance is the AlphaFold 2 from Google and the EvoFormer model. What this has done is it's really advanced protein structure prediction. We know what the sequences are based on our genomics, but we never really figured out what the 3D structures are of all the different um, biological entities. And so if we can predict the 3D structure accurately, we can predict how different compounds will bind to it. We can predict how the other biologicals will interact with it, predict pathways and many more things. And so this is just a, a fantastic opportunity of a lifetime for the bioinformatics and computational biologists. Many exciting things happen in this space based upon this new technology and all these new predictions. 
And so to conclude, it's gonna be a remarkable era for AI in the pharma and biotech space. We're only really a few years into it. Yes, we've had 20, 30 years of AI being applied to different pharma problems, but the new technologies that have just emerged are very exciting. They go beyond the image, natural image processing and the chemistry-based applications. And I think the future is gonna be wide open as to how they fit in and what they can be done. But it's all going to depend on this integration of different data sets and the application of AI machine learning on top of that um, and providing lots of opportunities for personal medicine, digital twins, and, and many more things. And we'll see what the future holds. Uh, that's my last slide, and I just want to thank you for your time and attention. I won't be able to stay, but please send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Peter. We really appreciate the presentation. Very mouthful and very informative. I'm trying to look for some questions from the chat. I don't see anything at the moment. And, uh, oh yes, no, there's nothing. So I believe, uh, just like you said, uh, for all those that are having questions, they will be sending to you, probably on email and then you will address them from that site. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. We'll be taking a short break right now and we will have our final uh, presentation from Dr. Jayshree. Um, we'll take a two minutes break and then we'll come back. Thank you so much. <laughs> 